LPC Thinks webinar. My name is Susan Mudd, and I'm a senior policy advocate at the Environmental Law and Policy Center. ELPC Thinks is where we bring experts, leaders, and community partners together to forge new strategies for progress. A quick heads up. We will be recording this webinar and streaming live on Facebook to share it for those uh, who are not able to join us. Today, we're talking with Superintendent Tim Forker of the Williams Field Schools near Peoria, Illinois. It's an exciting time in the electric school bus world. The US Environmental Protection Agency recently announced a billion dollars in federal funding with the Midwest receiving 140 million going to about 40 districts across the region. You'll be seeing more electric buses on the road near you in the near future. Superintendent Forker is a leader on this issue. He has now has a fleet of electric school buses serving his district that will also be an important part of his district's microgrid and supplying energy back to the grid eventually. Tim will discuss opportunities and challenges he encountered and how school districts across the Midwest can seek out state and federal funding for zero emission buses that are already saving money for Williams Field Schools. So let's get started. We'll hear from Tim for a bit and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Please submit your questions via the chat or in the Q&A box. You can do that at any time and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Tim, thanks for being here. Uh, let's hear from you first. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me, Susan. As Susan said, I'm Tim Forker. I'm superintendent at Williamsfield Schools. Uh, we're a small rural district uh, just west of Peoria, Illinois, between Peoria and, and Galesburg, not too far off of, of Interstate 74. Um, I have to start by giving a huge thanks to Susan and the, the ELPC team um, Susan and I have been discussing school bus electrification since um, the first uh, Volkswagen settlement money became available in Illinois, which is maybe going on five, six years, something like that now. Uh, and it just it naturally fit into our plans. The more and more Susan and I uh, discussed it, the more it seemed like an, an opportunity that our kids in our community could could benefit from. And I want to give you a little bit of the foundation for um, why we've chosen this direction. Um, for us, you know, Susan and I have been talking for several years. Conceptually, um, the, a microgrid on campus uh, was started by our student STEM team eight years ago. Uh, they were working on a, on a project uh, with some industry partners in our, our utility, Amber in Illinois, and they developed a campus microgrid. Uh, at that time, it was common for our community to experience extended outages. Um, we're, we are a small community at the end of an Amor and Illinois run. Uh, so when there is an outage, typically we're one of the last uh, communities restored. Uh, because as, as Ameren should, as, as you and I both would do if we were, if we were in charge of the operation, you got to get the most people online, uh, back online as quick as you can. And that just always put us at the end of the line. Um, so developing a little bit of energy independence uh, was very important to us. Um, in addition, you know, doing so in ways that supported the production of clean energy was also very important to us. Uh, until a few years ago, all of our electricity uh, was manufactured at the Edwards Power Plant uh, just south of, of Peoria. It's a, it's a coal-fired power plant. Um, that is a long time um, violator of a variety of, of clean air clean air acts. Um, and, and they violated to such an extent that they um, there was a settlement awarded and, and that's really kind of where we we got our start with uh, helping school districts secure money for electric school buses was through access to Edwards settlement funds. Um, so fast forward to today. So that's that's where we started, why we started. Along the way, um, we recognized that even back then, you know, six, eight years ago, the number of kids in our in our district um, who were having respiratory um, troubles was on the rise. Uh, the number of asthmatic students was on the rise. Um, and that was pre-COVID. Um, Post-COVID, it's it's done nothing but accelerate. So um, add the incentive of removing particulate matter in and around the school buses where our 
most vulnerable kids already ride. Uh, just one more piece of of uh, incentive to work for fire fleet. So we've been working on that for, you know, we go back eight years with designing some type of resiliency for uh, electricity here on campus is where we first started talking about electric school buses. And then last fall, fall 2022, we were fortunate to receive some uh, clean school bus rebates from uh, the, the US EPA. Um, November, uh, at the end of October, things started taking, taking shape as far as electric school bus deliveries. But starting in November of, of you know, just this past November, 2023, um, all daily routes have been run with electric school buses. Um, we're proud to say that those are electric school buses that were manufactured in Illinois, Lion Electric School Buses, they're near, near Joliet. Uh, and at this point, with buses run in November, December, and now we're at the end of January, um, you know, a couple of the coldest winter months here, December and January, I'll just read a little bit of stats uh, for you as to, to how our operation is, is seeing benefits. Um, we've logged 22,745 miles on our electric buses since November 1st. Um, we've burned or used or consumed 20,752 kilowatt hours of energy uh, to travel those miles. That equates to an average, an overall fleet average of 1.09 kilowatt hours of electricity per mile, which is significantly better than what we anticipated, especially in, in the winter months. So we're burning just over a kilowatt hour of electricity per mile traveled. Um, had we been uh, traveling these routes uh, with diesel buses, uh, we, we would have spent, and this is using real money based upon our, our current diesel contract, we would have spent uh, right around $14,000 on diesel fuel to travel those miles. Uh, because of the way we are implementing our students' microgrid plan, we have solar a solar array on site, and a power purchase agreement in place that gives us a low, low price uh, for the electricity that that array produces, um, we've spent $500 on electricity to fuel those buses. So let me just do that math. I'll back that math up a little bit. Um, we would have, in a normal year, every other year, besides this one, spent $14,000 to fuel our buses in November, December, and January. Um, this year, we've spent $500 uh, to fuel those buses. Um, so we're extremely uh, proud of, I mean, there's so many people here on staff and, and in the industry that we have to thank um, that led to a successful implementation, that led to us getting the funding to be able to, to uh, get these assets in our district. But we're extremely um, uh, excited and, and proud of the way things are going thus far. Uh, now, as Susan mentioned, we're not just uh, our vision isn't just to utilize these buses for transportation. Because one of the things that we've realized uh, throughout this process is that our school buses sit still 93% of the calendar year. Um, so as we transitioned to uh, electric school buses, we wanted to get more bang for our buck with regards to those high dollar assets. Um, our school bus fleet is also the, it's the second biggest capital investment we make. And that's true of, of a vast majority of, of school districts. You have your buildings and then you have your buses and those are your biggest capital assets. Um, so we were, we're spending a lot of money on assets that we only utilize 7% of the calendar year. And that's just historically how the operation is, is run. Because you have to have buses to move the kids, but you don't uh, utilize uh, that asset very, very often. So, um, we have worked, uh, we've constructed our infrastructure to support bi-directional charging uh, for our buses. Uh, we have, we'll have a fleet of eight electric buses when we are fully um, equipped. Right now we have seven new line electrics. Uh, we have one uh, C electric slash uh, IC bus repower or a transformed bus. Uh, in development right now uh, through, and that's purchased through Midwest Transit Equipment out of Kankakee. Um, we anticipate receiving that at the uh, end of February, early March, giving us a full fleet of eight electric buses and four bi-directional chargers and dispensers in the bus barn. What the bi-directional chargers are going to allow us to do, um, 
it'll it'll allow us to offload energy from those bus batteries to either utilize in our building uh, at times when the solar array is not producing energy um, or to back feed to the grid when it's uh, beneficial, uh, you know, not only financially, but from a transmission standpoint, when it's beneficial to offload uh, energy uh, to the grid to support our community. Um, and in the, uh, in the end, uh, uh, lead to a better utilization of our assets, both physically and financially. And, you know, from a long-term vision standpoint, uh, stabilize our local grid in a way that leads to better economics for our local rate payers as well. Um, the last piece that I'll add is, you know, this is the the other important component to our fleet electrification uh, operation, our journey, our vision, uh, is a mutual aid agreement with um, Knox County. Uh, Knox, we are a small village in Knox County. There, there are other small small villages in the county to our north and and south, and we are working with um, Knox County Emergency Response to get a mutual aid agreement in place where our electric school buses can go provide emergency electricity to other communities uh, in our county in the event of a disaster. Um, maybe that's a cooling center in a, a little town of Yates City that's south of us uh, if the grid is down. Uh, maybe it's a warming facility uh, in Victoria, Illinois, just to the north of us. Uh, and, and maybe it's just to our local public library, uh, which was constructed as an emergency shelter, um, you know, from the ground up anyway. So that's the full um, scope of, of what we have uh, envisioned. And we're, we're super excited. Things are, are working well so far. And we can't wait to get all of the um, yeah, the assets in, in, in place and realize the vision. Tim, it's great to hear you describe the thorough nature that you've thought this through. Um, you are an inspiration to people already and your ongoing experience will continue to, to inspire people here across the Midwest and elsewhere. So thanks, thanks first of all for encapsulating so much of what you've done um, in a short way to give people a picture of, of what's going on. Um, one thing, um, people are people are agog at the numbers that you just cited. So I wanna make sure you can say them again so people yeah. heard them right. You, if, please correct me if I've got them wrong, but in a normal three month period that you just experienced, November through January, you would have spent normally $14,000 on diesel and to run the same amount of buses for the same of time and in the same dates, it cost you $500 in electricity. Did we hear that right? Spot on, yeah, that's correct. Um, now, and that's just using the mileage of the buses, right? And the, the price that we pay per kilowatt hour for electricity and the price that we currently pay for diesel. Uh, the interesting part of that is the gap is going to continue to widen. Um, because we're locked in with the solar uh, power purchase agreement. We're in year four of a 15-year agreement, and we have a 1% escalator on the price of that electricity. Um, the, this is my 11th year as superintendent at Williamsfield. On average, our diesel price per gallon has gone up 8% annually. Um, so what we would have spent in diesel, you know, theoretically, according to trends, will continue to increase by 8% every year, whereas what we are going to pay, what we are locked into for electricity is on a 1% escalator. Now, I'll t I will, the asterisk there is um, that that math is hard to attain right now. Uh, we were very, very fortunate, and this, this is a lot of credit to our kids and, and the timing of the, the ideas that they had. Um, we were able to get involved in the uh, renewable, uh, the adjustable block program in here in Illinois and, and locking at a really high rate for renewable energy credits early in the game. Um, those type of prices for renewable energy credits, uh, will, the state probably won't see again. Uh, it was designed to get more solar, uh, to fuel the solar in industry here in the state. And it's it's done a really good job. And and we're taking advantage of, of that opportunity as it, as it was presented. 
So other school districts might not be able to get the huge delta in savings, but for those who are um, just looking at the volatility of diesel compared to electricity, they can still expect to have significant savings. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, costs of electric school buses has definitely been an issue. We hear all the time about how they're so expensive and it's true that at the moment they are significantly more expensive than for instance, buying a new diesel. But you've clearly figured out some systems and been successful at applying for funding um, at the federal level. Um, can you um, say a little bit about how easy or hard that was and what other, um, what other districts might expect in terms of access to funds to help with the initial upfront cost? Yeah, there are a lot of mechanisms out there right now. I really think this next, you know, it's we, we're already probably 24 months in uh, to some some pretty good opportunities that have been been presented. You know, and we've got I think you know 24 more months of of really solid opportunities. Uh, there are incentives out there right now, and the whole. Uh, design of these government incentives, whether it be the EPA Clean School Bus uh, Rebate Program, the EPA Clean School Bus Grant Program, uh, the DARA Program, the different uh, Volkswagen Settlement Programs, the um, the transition that that allows uh, school districts access uh, through IRS direct pay access to these uh, commercial fleet electrification incentives. And these alternate fuel charging station, you know, or alternate fuel equipment uh, incentives that are available through the federal government. So there are a lot of opportunities um, out there right now that are designed uh, to fuel the transition of this industry to to electrification, and at the very least um, allow people to to purchase vehicles and equipment at a price that's uh, equal to the capital investment that it takes uh, to purchase a diesel bus or, or some type of an, of an ICE engine, um, you know, uh, running their fleet. Now, they, so that's, and that's just what I think they've done really well. All these incentives are out there to try and make sure that the upfront cost is, is the same or similar. Um, and then what, what people have to add to their equation is the uh, same, savings of these operational um, costs, you know, the overall operational savings. Uh, when I show folks a TCO, a total cost of ownership calculator for an, an electric school bus um, over a 10 year period, and understand that a, a lot of folks, most folks run their, their buses longer than 10 years. Um, but at a 10 year period, um, you know, there's, the investment that's needed right now, the outside incentives that are that are needed right now, are somewhere in the ballpark of two hundred thousand dollars per unit to get at price parity with diesel. Um, and those numbers exist in these opportunities that are out there now. Um, there are also creative uh, funding opportunities. Um, you know, and and you know, I'm. Uh, administrative lead for the Bus to Grid initiative, which was started as this whole concept, you know, Susan was there when I was sharing ideas back and forth of just trying to get schools together to um, consolidate their efforts on these uh, grant opportunities and these funding opportunities to electrify. Um, but now what we have access to as, as the Bus to Grid initiative are these um, additional investment, outside investment opportunities from firms that are um, interested in fleet electrification and the returns that they can get with these investments in the in the energy field. Um, so I say I I say that because there are opportunities to electrify fleets with outside investments that at the best can that can lead to minimal uh, increases in your operational expenses with little to no upfront costs. I'm glad you, you know, in that. that I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say in that vein, think of a lot of uh, school districts lease their diesel buses. And let's say their lease is $25,000 per year per bus. Um, there are opportunities out there where, where you, instead of leasing a diesel bus, maybe you can lease an electric bus for $27,000 a year. Um, now, you're so $2,000 is the price tag to have your kids ride a clean bus versus 
um, riding a, a bus that kicks out diesel fumes. And, you know, I think school districts, parents, families um, are all in favor of a very small investment to ensure that their kids are breathing clean air to and from school. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you brought up that last option. Um, lots of questions are coming in from audience members. Um, and one had to do with um, if, and I think you have some experience with this, while you, Williamsfield owns its own fleet, there are definitely school districts that are served by contractors. Do you see um, the, the programs that are out there and the companies that you've worked with uh, able to help school districts in that situation? There are. There are leaders in the field that see the value of these electric school bus batteries as, as assets. Um, right. We've had a lot of conversations with, with Cook Illinois Corp. And they've been, you know, they've been uh, they've worked with, you know, River Trails is a good example. Um, they work with River Trail school districts and they're running a they run running a Bluebird electric bus in that district right now in a in a partnership. Um, First Student, which is one of the most well known names uh, in the school bus transportation industry, uh, secured money in that same round of funding that we did the, the fall 2022 EPA clean school bus rebates uh, and uh, secured a significant amount of funding in the significant amount of money or funding in this last uh, round of EPA grants, as did STA, um, which is a, you know, if folks are in the Chicagoland area and they and they contract with Positive Connections, um, that's an STA um, organization. So folks are looking, you know, third parties are looking to make the, the transition. They see the value in these assets and the opportunities um, to upgrade their fleets you know, first and foremost with this government funding, um, they can get new buses and 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 retire the retire a lot of the old ones. So I'm seeing opportunities that are there. Now what I caution folks who contract with third parties, um, when you submit for grant funding for these, the third party contractor cannot get this funding without attaching it to your school district. So you should get some of the value of that asset. I mean, that should be written into your contract. And that's upfront value as well as future value. Uh, because first students smart, they know that there are um, there are bi-directional, you know, vehicle to grid uh, revenue mechanisms that are that are starting to mature. Um, so they see that value and and it's important for school districts to make sure that they they partner with companies that are that are going to share in those opportunities. You're right, Tim, and the 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 sharing needs to be both in the short term during the contract, but also at the period at the end of the required time frame for the school district to be served according to the federal funds, which is five years. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely important. Um, so um, many th many questions coming in, but um, one that always comes up, um, and that you've now had three months of experience with in your district, is cold weather. How do these buses yeah. handle cold weather? Can they handle cold weather? Are your students freezing or what's how is it going with the with cold weather and operating electric school buses in central Illinois? Extremely well. And I'm knocking on my wood wood top of my desk <laughs> right now, but extremely well. Um, now there's some caveats there. A, I have a very good fleet manager. Um, you know, our, when you're a small district, he's your transportation director, your fleet manager, your mechanic, and you, he's in charge of dispatch, you know, and he drives sometimes. I know that's true in a, in a lot of areas. He is phenomenal. Our drivers have been phenomenal. Um, we have a very um, good setup. We have it here in, in these parts. Uh, we, we don't call it a bus depot. It's a bus barn. Uh, so we have a, a, a barn that our uh, buses, a Morton building, a shed that our buses can pull straight into and charge. Now it's not heated, but it's inside. Um, so what that allows us to do is very seamlessly, we're able to precondition our buses uh, to make sure that they're, uh, they're warm before they ever unplug. Another asterisk. So our buses um, have diesel auxiliary heat. Um, what that um, allows us to do is to heat the cabin using a small diesel heater 
uh, rather than uh, using electricity from the batteries to, to do so. Now, interestingly, during this extremely cold stretch that we had, um, first and foremost, our, typically our threshold is negative 20 degrees. If there's a real field temperature of negative 20 or lower, we cancel school. Um, that's Now my friends in Minnesota say that's when they close the playground <laughs> <laughs> and keep them inside recess. But for us here, we cancel the school when it's negative 20 real field or, or colder. Um, but for those days when it was negative 15 real feel and maybe negative five real temperature, uh, the only extra work our fleet manager uh, had to do was he had a torpedo heater that he was uh, running underneath the fuel tanks of those diesel auxiliary heaters to make sure that the diesel <laughs> heaters didn't come up. <laughs> you know, whereas the other districts running diesel buses are really concerned about their engines and the diesel fuel running through the engines, making sure it doesn't gum up uh, in the cold. The only issue um, that we uh, foresaw was the potential of the heaters gumming up. So the nice, quiet, comfortable ride uh, wasn't uh, wasn't chilly at all. Uh, so our, our buses have been running uh, very well in the cold. Um, I've got I've, I'm very fortunate to have be connected with a pretty good electrification network and and speak with folks up in Michigan, uh, in particular, who've been doing this longer than me. Um, and they've they've had serious or uh, similar experiences. So you mentioned um, just just a moment ago, Tim, the excellent teamwork that you've had at Williams Field yeah. with your transportation team and yourself um, making this all work. Um, one of the questions that came in had to do with what are the staff needs for managing the microgrid. Um, and the solar panels, and how has that impacted this whole um, excellent um, setup that you've got? Yeah, no, that's the the beauty of it. In in Illinois, one of the most popular routes for schools to go to implement solar is the solar power purchase agreement. Um, what that, that means is we lease the land uh, to a third party company. They own and maintain the array. And financially, it's they're incentivized to make sure it produces to its full capabilities, you know, because they make money based upon that um, array producing electricity. Um, so they they are in charge of that. Now, us being boots on the ground, what that means is if we have a a wind uh, event come through and and something happens uh, to a panel, a panel is dislodged. Uh, or ours is a single axis, so it's a tilting uh, system that moves with the sun. We've had the wind um, strip gears in some of those motors. We just report that uh, to the company, and and they they maintain the the asset to make sure it produces. Now, when we're talking about full microgrid, um, that work is pretty much done behind the scenes. That's a lot of software. That's a lot of algorithms. The full vision of that, you know, I see um, Bob put in the in the uh, chat, you know, talking about what it would cost in ComEd with what the the rate structures that are in, mm -hmm. in ComEd. And I love his point because his point is using that rate structure would cost significantly more than what we're paying, but still significantly less than what you would pay for diesel. Uh, now our goal, so. Um, it's, we're not the only ones getting the microgrid. We wrote the grant to the Department of Energy and there are 16 additional school districts that are working. Um, we're, we're all working together to deploy this technology for microgrids on what would be 17 Illinois public school campuses. Um, handful of them are in common territory. Um, what we're working to do in all territories is control those costs by using algorithms within the software that can discharge uh, batter or discharge energy to the grid to keep capacity charges low, and um, conduct managed charging of the fleet, uh, so that we're uh, purchasing energy from the grid at times when when the cost is low, and we're offloading energy to the grid at times, or at very least just stabilized with the grid when at times of peak demand. So yeah, that's our that's our vision. Our vision's not just to so that's the vision isn't just to earn vehicle to grid revenue. 
but it's to use the technology to control costs, to charge at the correct times, um, to discharge at the rest times so that we keep capacity charges low, you know, all of the, all of the above. As um, I know you said that you're the electric utility that serves Williams Field is Ameren, Illinois. And there was a question about whether that's an investor-owned utility or a co-op. We know that it's a large investor-owned utility that serves most yes. of central and southern Illinois. Um, and I'm wondering um, how they've been in terms of helping you with the managed charging, helping you with any of the uh, implementation um, of the whole the whole project. No, oh, they've been great. They really have been great. I mean, they've they've been great in the regards of, of you know, um, go ahead and and do that. They haven't been great in saying, hey, we'll help. <laughs> they just haven't stood in our way of of getting this stuff done. I think they're I think they see the value in it, you know, for them as a utility down the road too. Um, now they don't have the financial mechanisms in place to compensate us for offloading to the grid currently. Um, but we're, we don't necessarily feel like at the end of the day, we're gonna be reliant on utility-based programs uh, to generate revenue from these assets. Um, we feel like we can we can use uh, managed charging to, to save money and that, that's just a benefit of the, of the assets that we own. Uh, we think um, when we collectively are able to hit the wholesale energy market, um, you know, then we will be able to generate revenue for those of us in Ameren territory through the MISO marketplace. And we don't necessarily need the um, the utility program, um, you know, to, to compensate us for doing so. Now, all of that said, I believe it is in the best interest of our utility and our rate payers uh, for the utility programs to be put in place so that our rate payers around us within our community um, and our shared utility um, all experience the benefits of what our assets and assets like them um, can, can you know, the benefits that, that, that they can produce. Um, we would much rather do that than make money in the wholesale energy market because everybody wins. You know, interestingly, and I'm get, I'll get in the weeds for a little bit for the folks that are on the call that that like that are into the, the to the energy side of this. Um, you know, we're we have 300 students pre K through 12. Um, when all the smoke clears, and this should be by by August 1st, um, that's our goal. Knock on wood. By August 1st, we'll have over a meg of callable stored energy on site in a little district like ours, right? So now do the math across, across Illinois um, and, and you can start to envision what the opportunity, uh, you know, the, the true opportunity that exists. You know, as people start talking about, you know, um, storage is the bottleneck. Uh, once, once, you, once you have a lot of wind and a lot of solar and these intermittent um, solar production sources, um, you're only as good as you can store and deliver. Uh, and, and what's interesting to me is if we're paying as school districts, which is taxpayers, right? Taxpayers are also the, the rate payers. Um, if we're already buying school buses and we're only using them 7% of the calendar year, why can't we do this in a way that leverages those huge bus batteries to the benefit of all of us uh, rather than mining for more materials to make more batteries when our batteries are just sitting still and we can deploy, we can utilize technology to deploy the energy in a way that's responsible to the health of the battery as well. Yeah, it's you You hit it there, Tim. Um, clearly these electric school buses are very large batteries on wheels. So I wanted to ask you um, something else that you mentioned um, right up at the, at the top. Um, had to do with the mutual aid agreement that you're coming to with the yeah. county in which Williamsfield is, Knox County. Can you tell us a little bit about that about that plan? Yeah, the idea is just is to get an agreement in place to where um, emergency services can call on us um, to have our vehicles brought, our big our electric school buses brought to a specific site to provide emergency uh, power when a grid is down. 
Uh, now the premise will be, you know, so long as they are available, right? If we need them for transportation uh, purposes, we have to be able to use them for transportation purposes. But if we don't, and this is just in our nature anyway, uh, we want to utilize that asset so our the community surrounding us um, can be, you know, uh, at worst, you know, protected in the event of a of a disaster and emergency. And when I say protected, I mean um, really hot stretches where the grid could potentially go down, or you have um, you have elderly uh, individuals with no place to go to stay to stay cool and the exact opposite, you know, in, in cold, extreme, extreme weather. Um, but at the very least, you know, just to be able to provide, you know, some comfort for folks who have experienced a disaster, you know, until that, until their, their grid can, can go back live. I mean, that's our, that's our whole, um, you know, our whole, the found, like the core values that we have, uh, the, the, that hold this whole, uh, project up are are around community and sharing and you know and and help and and assistance and so I mean that's that's what we're working to put in place and it's not a super complicated um, uh, document or agreement um, it's just getting the right people on the right calls to understand what the these assets can do. Two things stemming from that. Um, one is, first of all, your your vision for the community and the community resilience is so important as we think about what our world is facing in terms of climate change. Um, a very practical questions have come in about warranties. Um, yeah. Warranties on the bus, warranties on the batteries. Um, are, are any of the strategies that you're employing, either the idea of sending power back to the grid sometimes, um, and or this community resilience idea of helping in emergencies are either of those um, ideas threatened by the warranties that um, are on the buses or on the batteries? For us, short term, no, not at all. Um, and I say that because our buses, when the, the math for us is we, we've got a brand new fleet for free. Um, is that's basically now we've we've combined a handful of incentives to make that true, but we've got all new buses and we've got um, you know two and a half million dollars worth of assets um, for free. So I'm not real concerned about battery degradation, um, and we in getting uh, seven years uh, out of a uh, out of a battery instead of eight. You know the ba the battery warranty uh, for all of the major uh, manufacturers is eight years. Uh, some of them do have discharge numbers in their warranty. Um, so once you discharge a certain amount of energy, then that that warranty is um, is expired. Um, but they also offer, we didn't purchase it, but they offer extended warranties. You know, the man manufacturers do as well. Uh, what we're working to do, and I say that, um, you know, we're still... Uh, doing everything we can, we're not we're not interested in just charging, discharging, and destroying our batteries. Uh, we're interested in making these assets last as long as they possibly can, and doing that through intelligent charged uh, uh, managed charging. Now, um, right now, uh, we are just we're plugging in, we're charging to full, we're using them when we need them, and we're getting back to the bus barn, and we're plugging in, and we're charging to full. Uh, as we get comfortable with the fleet and we're, we, uh, we see the patterns, we know the equipment uh, is uh, continuously reliable. Our sweet spot, what the research indicates is the sweet spot is between 20 and 80%. So when we um, uh, deploy managed charging techniques, we're going to charge to 80 and we're going to discharge no lower than 20. That's going to be our target. And that's whether we're using the um, electric school buses for transportation or as energy assets. And so that you know, my math of us having one meg of callable stored energy on site factors in that 80-20 range. Um, so that factors in that we're not charging above 80 and we're not discharging below 20. So those Tim, are good uh, questions. Absolutely. Really, really good questions. Yeah. Um, there a lot of good questions have come in from um, people who are who are listening in. Um, there are a number of people listening today who are not school officials, but are very interested, um, whether they're parents or other community members, want to help 
um, electric school buses come to their districts. What recommendations might you have uh, for such people who aren't in an official position like you, but would like to help yeah. their district um, get to where yours is? My best recommendation is get your kids involved. Get the, you know, your kids, the youth of your community, they're leaders. Um, and really, if you can find one, you know, we had one, uh, still have uh, one really good uh, uh, science teacher that's our STEM leader, you know, that's, uh, I mean, she's just a dynamic individual uh, already. She teaches ecology, ecology in, in, to our high school and our middle school kids. Um, so you get some people passionate about it. Uh, that can put just real uh, uh, data and, and presentations together uh, that can combat some of the some of the naysayers and some of the um, you know just flag out min misinformation that's that's peddled. Uh, that's the number one, uh, and and it wasn't even a strategy for us. They were just doing it, <laughs> and it just worked to you know to help accelerate. Our plans. Our kids are the. When we first got solar on site, there weren't that many solar panels around our area, um, and our kids are the ones that went door to door to the neighbors. Our kids are the ones that put the presentations together for the community, um, and they've continued to to do similar stuff with our with fleet electrification. And um, so, yeah, get your kids in. Get your kids involved. Um, encourage conversations. Objective, fact based conversations. Um, let people, you know, let the yabbits in the room uh, give their yabbits, you know, yeah, but don't the batteries catch fire? Yeah, but well, they're not going to work in the cold, you know, yeah, but, um, you know, there's none of, you know, there's no charging stations anywhere. You know, let those folks ask those questions, answer them objectively, and just keep the conversation going. That's, I mean, I found that to be the most successful strategy. Get your kids, your teachers involved and just try and uh, lay out objective evidence and reasoning. The cell is becoming easier and easier. And that's because of what Susan said at the top of, of the meeting. And that's, there are more and more and more of these buses that are on the road, that are around the neighborhood. Um, you know, more people are becoming more and more familiar with electric, e you know, equipment, uh, you know, not not just in the transportation industry, but people are electrifying a lot of different parts of their of their lives. Uh, and you have, you know, Teslas are more and more popular. Uh, Ford F-150 Lightnings are more and more popular. You've got Rivians driving around. Um, I mean, everything's becoming a lot more and more, not just popular, but proven. It's moved away from theory to, to reality, and we're, we're starting yeah. to see it in our daily lives. Um, one last question before we wrap, Tim. Did you have any unexpected benefits for either your district or your students or the community, something you didn't anticipate uh, before the buses actually arrived? A couple of things I didn't anticipate entirely anticipate, you know, A, you know, for the kids, when I rode the buses with them for the first few times, how do you like the bus? Oh, it's new. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for them, that was the first thing. We got a brand new bus. It smells new. Um, you know, one cool thing that we didn't expect uh, that I didn't even know going into this, you know, we had different laws in Illinois for school buses and uh, semi-tractor trailers. Um, as far as width. Uh, prior to our line electrics hitting the road, the law in Illinois was uh, the max allowable width for a school bus was, I believe it was 96 inches. Mm -hmm. um, and semi-truck and tractor trailers were, were able to be 102. Uh, so um, our buses are the first, we worked with the, the Department of Transportation and Lying Electric and the governor's office and folks and ours are the first 102s to be traveling the roads in Illinois. Now, what that did is it added six inches width to the aisle of the bus, which we didn't anticipate, but you no longer have to walk sideways down the aisle of the bus or shimmy back and forth to get up and down the, the bus aisle. Um, so those things were unexpected benefits. The, the quietness of the ride was an unexpected uh, benefit. The smoothness of the ride 
due to the weight being distributed a lot more evenly um, was we thought that that was going to be a benefit, but it's it's been better than than we expected. And the way that they handle on slick roads is better than a diesel bus, again, because the weight distribution is is so much better. Wow, thanks, Tim. Those are very yeah. practical things that matter to everybody every day, um, students and drivers. Um, so thanks. Um, so we're at time. I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us, and especially uh, Superintendent Borker for his expertise and sharing his experience with us. Um, expanding the adoption of electric school buses is an important priority for ELPC. It's good for the environment, good for kids' health, and we call that a win-win. Uh, we will be hosting future webinars on a variety of topics, so please keep an eye out on your email for invitations. Thanks again, and goodbye for today.